today, as I mentioned in my greeting, today we celebrate, the church celebrates, the church universal at the prompting of St. John Paul II, dedicated this Sunday, Divine Mercy Sunday, Divine Mercy. And the central focus of our celebration thus is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who opened the floodgates of God's mercy, opened the floodgates of God's mercy to pour out upon us. And that's based both on scripture and on the revelations of St. Faustina Kowalska, who, Kowalska, who, who uh, had the revelations of the divine mercy, <coughs> of which John Paul II, of course, was very familiar with. They were both from Poland, and he thus dedicated this beautiful Sunday, the second Sunday of Easter, Divine Mercy Sunday, and with good reason. We talk about divine mercy in these beautiful readings. St. Peter, in today's second reading, says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in his great mercy gave us a new birth to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance, an inheritance. You know, when we receive an inheritance, it's a great gift from someone who probably loves us or respects us, and it's not something that should be expected, though. Many people make that a mistake. An inheritance is a gift, and this is a free gift, a free gift <clears throat> given, but listen to what St. Peter says about it. That inheritance is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Of course, we know that we have to cooperate with this divine grace in order for us to receive that inheritance. Again, it's not something that we can presume. St. John Paul II, in his canonization of Sister Mary Faustina Kowalska, instituted this day into the church. In his homily, he said this, It is important, then, that we accept the whole message that comes to us from the Word of God on this second Sunday of Easter, which from now on throughout the church will be called Divine Mercy Sunday. In the various readings, the liturgy seems to indicate the path of mercy which, while reestablishing the relationship of each person with God, also creates new relations of fraternal solidarity among human beings. Christ has taught us that man not only receives and experiences the mercy of God, but we are also called to practice mercy towards others. As St. Matthew says in his gospel, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. That is from John Paul II, a saint, of course, we know now. That mercy is easily seen in the many healing miracles <clears throat> recalled in the gospel. And we hear in this gospel that there are many other signs, many other things that Jesus performs that are not written in this book. There would be overflowing. But these signs are given to us so that we may believe. In each one, whether a physical or a spiritual miracle, the power of God, the power of Christ to renew, to forgive and heal, bursts into the life of the person who receives it. And at times, even turns upside down the very laws of nature. That is what miracles do. And that's today, we have a, a congregation for miracles. If someone is going to be or, want, or is, is on the road to canonization, we have to have a miracle attributed to them. And they have scientists <clears throat> and all kinds of people that study what has happened to see if there was a reasonable answer as to why it happened, or scientific reason, or whatever it may be. But it has to be declared, no, there's, there's no reason. We, ha we have no explanation for this. It's truly a miracle. It turns the world upside down. It turns nature upside down. That is what a miracle is all about. And Christ performed many, and so did many of the saints, and miracles still happen to this very day. In today's gospel, that specific ministry of forgiveness and mercy that Jesus gives to us is passed on to the disciples. When Jesus says to them, peace be with you, receive the Holy Spirit. And then we hear those words, he breathes upon them. 
That is, the, he is giving them the sacramental power. Those sins that you forgive are forgiven them. And those that you retain are retained. Those sins you forgive are forgiven. That is divine mercy, the divine mercy of Christ himself. When Thomas says he won't believe until he sees, until he touches the nail marks and puts his hand in the side, we have to understand we call Thomas the doubter. And it's a you know, famous saying, Thomas the doubter. He is broken, though. He is broken. He is distraught. He is grieving at the death of Jesus. And he cannot or will not bring himself to accept that the resurrection has happened. He, he wants to see as so many of us want to see. Today we say the same thing. I want to see, I want to see a miracle, I want to see it happen, and I'll believe. But Jesus gently takes him from that refusal to a moment of faith. He coaxes from Thomas one of the greatest confessions of faith. And he says to Thomas, touch, see my hands, and touch my side, and be believing. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And I say that every time we consecrate the bread and the wine. And I lift up that precious host and that precious chalice, exactly what I say, my Lord and my God. And many people do that, of course. It's a beautiful, beautiful, pious thing to do. It reminds us, yes, that we are in the presence, the physical presence of Christ. In that moment, though, when Thomas says that, my Lord and my God, he's healed. He's changed. His doubt is gone. He is healed of his grief and the pain that comes from uh, death of a loved one is changed from doubt to belief. Divine mercy. He receives it. And then all of them together, the, the disciples having experienced that same forgiveness and healing in their own lives, now the disciples are told to go out. They become carriers, vehicles of these gifts for all who will hear the gospel and respond, respond to their preaching. For what they say about the risen Christ is no mere fantasy. This is not a fantasy at all. They witnessed his death on the cross. Now they witness with their very eyes his resurrection. They touch with their hands and they say that he is fully alive. They went to their death, 11 of them, because of that faith. Nobody goes to their death for a fantasy. And many of the early Christians did the same. Christians today are still doing the same. There are Christians around the world who are still persecuted and put to death for their faith. Nobody goes to their death for a fantasy. Christ is fully risen, body and soul. He is risen. He is fully alive. And we, as his followers, just as the disciples, we are also to preach that to the world. Divine mercy. The need for those gifts of mercy and healing are as great today as they were in apostolic times, St. John Paul II noted. Without it, without divine mercy, we are lost. We are lost. We are still slavery to sin, unable to be reconciled with God. But with divine mercy, we can receive forgiveness. So as we continue to celebrate the resurrection, we, can, we continue to celebrate this Sunday, this Divine Mercy Sunday, let us seek to open our hearts to those gifts and then commit ourselves to be conduits of them, to be vehicles of them, to go out there to reach to others, to preach the mercy and forgiveness of God, to change not only our own hearts, but at least to try to change others' hearts so that they will come back to the path of goodness and holiness, so that they will receive the divine mercy of God, so that one day he will say all to us in heaven, peace be with you. Divine mercy.